My name is Miriam Barcelona Ingenito, and I'm the acting director here at the Department of Toxics. With me, I have Deputy Director Stuart Black, who is the deputy over our cleanup program. I have with me Dr. Meredith Williams, who's the deputy director of the Safer Products and Workplaces program, and Josh Tooker, who is our legislative director. I'm going to cover a few logistical issues first. Uh, before we get started, I wanted um, first to let anybody in the audience know that if you need Spanish translation, um, I have with us today, we have Veronica Lopez Villasenor. And actually, Veronica, do you want to offer services in Spanish, please? In the microphone, please. En que necesita translación, por favor, me pregunten si necesita algo. So I'm not seeing anybody now, but if later folks need, uh, Veronica's in uh, the public participation program. Um, we will keep an eye out, and she'll be sitting here in the, the front of the room, and uh, she can help with any Spanish translation through, throughout the meeting. Uh, restrooms are located out the door to my left, um, and then down this little hallway here. And in the event of a fire alarm or other need of an exit, it's out the back doors here, down the stairs to the lobby, and out the front doors to the park there. Uh, for those of you attending the first for the first time, we are not a board um, or a commission that are required to have. I'm going to move this closer to me because I feel like I'm leaning on the table. Uh, we're not a board or a commission that is required to have a public meeting. But rather, um, we recognize that we make decisions that are tremendously important to the public, to Californians in general, and that it is incredibly important for the public to understand how we make those decisions and what decisions we are making. And so this public meeting is a vehicle for you to access and understand our decision making and the issues that are before the department. We understand that you have placed trust in us and that this trust can erode quickly. And that the most effective way of maintaining this trust is to give you access to the inner workings of our department. And so this is an opportunity to help provide that transparency. This meeting was created because this administration and because this DTSC team believes in that transparency. And so that is why we are having these public meetings. Um, today's public meeting and today's agenda, which I think is, did I do that? Did it change? Yay. Um, is a really, um, is a great agenda. It's a, it, we've got a lot to cover today. We've got some great progress to, to report to you on. We're going to have five presentations. The first one is on cost recovery, and it's in light of some recent, uh, some great work that we've been working on for three years, but also uh, some new resources that we've secured with the budget in light of the audit that we've recently received, and so we'll have an update on that. We will have an update on the permitting program as well as the implementation of our enhancement work plan. We'll have progress, uh, a progress report on our hazardous waste tracking efforts, and we'll have an overall systems improvement um, update on what we call our fixing the foundation. And that uh, will give you that overall report. It's been over a year now since we implemented fixing the foundations, and it's a report card, if you will, to, to the public. And then finally, uh, a legislative update on those pieces of legislation that are sitting on the governor's desk that could impact uh, the Department of Toxic Substances Control. So throughout uh, the day, we'll have a couple of uh, opportunities for the public to ask questions of DTSC. There'll be first a, a question, um, a general 
comment and question period at the beginning after our opening comments. Uh, and those are that this first comment period will be or question period will be for those issues that are not on the agenda. So questions that you comments, questions for other items. Uh, and you can either submit them via the webcast because we are being webcast as well or on comment cards which are located in the back of the room. Uh, we will try to answer the questions today. If I'm not able to answer them, if I don't have staff here or we don't have the answer right away, leave me your name um, and some contact information and the right staff person will get back to you. Otherwise, um, like I said, we'll try to do it today. Uh, if you are on webcast, uh, send your questions to DTSC public meeting at dtsc.ca.gov. Again, I don't know if that's up or can be up. Or if the, I don't know if the dub, it is up. DTSC public meeting at dtsc.ca.gov. Uh, so I think that covers the logistical issues. And then the last, and I guess the obvious for most, and I think everybody in the room probably is aware of this, but I'm gonna state it anyways. Um, the last time we had a public meeting, it was run by the former director, um, Debbie Raffel. Uh, for those of you that aren't aware, she has left the department and is the was appointed as the director of the environment for the city and county of San Francisco. And I am the acting director um, here at DTSC. And when I'm not the acting director, I am the chief deputy director here at DTSC. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, kind of a new face, but not really. So I just, for the record, and that would be the only other logistical change that you're seeing. So I want to, uh, without further ado, jump into today's meeting. I wanna thank you all uh, again for coming and really think that, um, that, that wanted to say that I'm excited to share with you the progress that we have made. Today you will be hearing about significant progress that we have made in fixing the foundation systems within DTSC. During the past three years, we have spent a significant amount of time identifying issues and identifying and creating work plans to help us fix those foundational issues. That is the first step in a very methodical, and I know that this is sometimes can be a painful process in making a long and enduring change. And this is not a quick fix, it is not maybe the fix that has happened in the past, but this is a fix that we believe that is different than those from the past because it will be enduring. So what we're gonna report on today is not that plans, but how we're implementing those plans. We've moved from that identifying the problems to creating the plans to implementing those plans. And so today, you're gonna hear about how we are institutionalizing and making strong, systematic change, what we are doing to make these changes part of the very fabric of DTSC and how those changes will greatly enhance the ability of DTSC to perform its core mission to protect the public health and the environment. So again, great progress has been made and we here, and again I have my, my program deputies up here with me, we're dedicated to seeing these changes through and, um, and know and recognize that it is a long process and that each one of the pre presenters today will be talking about these core changes and the progress that we've been made in these, that have been made in these key areas, and that we're committed to continuing to report the progress at these meetings on our website and in information that we share with the public generally, but also we'll be presenting this information and updates as we do oversight hearings um, with the legislature, and we have two of them later this month. Um, so again, it's a very transparent process that we are engaged in. And this is in part because we believe that 
real and lasting solutions come from a shared understanding and a collaborative public process. That the best way to make sure that this department is serving the needs of California is to make sure that we have a shared and collaborative understanding of our process, that we have all of your ideas, and that we understand your comments and your questions. And so we welcome them as we move forward today and as we continue down this process. So without further ado, I'm going to jump to um, the first round of public comments. And again, the purpose of this first public comment is for items that are not on the agenda, so not one of the, the cost recovery permitting work plan, hazardous waste tracking, um, the fixing the foundation items, or the ledge update, but items that we aren't going to be covering later in the agenda that you would like to make a comment on or have a question on specifically that you would like um, to bring to the department. I will take questions, and actually, Lim will take the, the comment cards and she'll bring them up um, to me, and then I'll ask you to come, or she'll bring you the mic. Or you can send them via the web. And these guys are shaking their heads. I've got a whole slot of time. I'll give people on the website some time to send some in. I can pass it around for karaoke. Yikes, somebody said yikes. <laughs> I am not going to sing as Meredith suggested. All right. Perhaps I can take questions later then, if anything comes in. Okay, should we move? All right. And then this part of my notes got smaller, so I have to put my glasses on, sorry. Um, I would like to start our first presentation. Um, I'd like to introduce Terry Hardy, who is our special assistant for program review, who will give us an update on our cost recovery effort um, and the results of a recently published audit by the California State Auditor. So, Terry. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm here today to talk to you about the findings of a recent state audit and our response to those recommendations. Further, I'd like to take this opportunity to share our cost recovery progress. During DTSC's 26-year history, our central mission has always been to protect the public and the environment. To that end, we have spent $1.9 billion during that period to clean up contamination. That work has been transformational. We've turned toxic waste dumps into space for parks, schools, homes, and businesses. We've removed petroleum products and toxic solvents from groundwater underneath schools and replaced soil contamination from lead with from low-income housing complexes in Los Angeles. Along with that primary mission, DTSC also has a responsibility to be good stewards of taxpayer dollars. We operate on a polluter pays principle. Simply put, those who cause the pollution should pay for regulation and cleanup, not the taxpayer. Historically, though, we've been better at the cleanup than the bill collecting. But I'm here today to tell you how we're changing that. We are different now. Last month, the California State Auditor's Office released a report on its findings of our cost recovery efforts. The report detailed that between 1987 and 2013, DTSC did not collect $194 million. And it validates what we know, that de the department has made progress and has procedures in place to keep us moving in the right direction. DTSC has made sweeping changes in its procedures, and we are aggressively pursuing cost recovery cases. As a result, we've reduced the number of sites with outstanding costs from 2,700 to less than 1,600, a 40% reduction. 
Also, we have reduced the total amount of outstanding cleanup costs by more than $24 million. That $24 million figure includes cash collected and settlements paid. It also includes data cleanup. For instance, if we received grant money but had not applied that to our costs, or it could be write-offs that we cannot collect, which may happen if a responsible party does not have adequate funds to pay. We don't know exactly how much money we've collected, although we are working to better track that information. The state auditor noted that our financial computing system is so archaic that it severely limits what kinds of reports we can create and therefore what kinds of information we can get. Adding new reports could literally cause the system to crash. Also, because we are part of a state effort to move to a new billing system, we have been prohibited from spending money to make changes. We have been able to gather some numbers, and I can say that we've brought in at least $2.1 million. The audit did find some problems and made 11 recommendations and we have a plan on how to address each one of those. But before I get into audit specifics, I'd like to provide some background. Until recently, standardized cost recovery procedures did not exist at DTSC. Computer systems used by people in the field and those in our billing office weren't linked and information often wasn't shared. Sometimes cleanup would be initiated to protect the public, and only later was cost recovery considered. Project managers, those scientists and engineers who oversaw the technical cleanup, were also placed in charge of bill collection. Recovering money is often complex and time consuming. It's not simply a matter of dropping a bill into the mail. Let me tell you about one example. In the mid-1980s, DTSC was called to the city of Davis to oversee cleanup efforts at a pesticide sales company called Frontier Fertilizer. For more than a decade, one company and then another had been operating at the site and illegally dumping chemicals into an unlined basin. Mace Ranch, a residential subdivision, was 800 feet north. The community only learned of this da dangerous practice, thank you, after a dog fell into the dumping pit and died from exposure to the toxics. The chemicals found there are linked to human health problems, ranging from infertility, genetic abnormalities, and cancerous cell growth. DTSC discovered a plume had spread beneath the homes had contaminated groundwater and was threatening the city's drinking water supply. Swift cleanup was crucial. DTSC and the Regional Water Quality Control Board oversaw initial remediation of the site. Soil was removed, monitoring and excavation wells were installed. At various times, the Yolo DA, the US EPA's National Enforcement Investigation Center, and the FBI were involved. Eventually, the U.S. attorney filed criminal action and some parties pleaded guilty. Collection, however, wasn't an easy matter. In February 1991, the department filed suit against Frontier Fertilizer, its owner, and other defendants. Frontier and their owners appealed, and the case spent years in the courts. DTSC eventually prevailed but then it was determined that judgments of $90 million stemming from other legal action had already been issued against the parties. So collection by DTSC was unlikely. We did settle with some responsible parties for more than $486,000. But as of April 2014, there was more than 4.3 million still owed to us. We have dis determined that that site is what we term an orphan, which means there is no viable party that can pay the bill. For the past three years, DTSC has embarked on 
and unflinching reform effort. That included a public disclosure on May 31st, 2013, that our unrecovered cost recovery amount was $184.5 million. This was for the period July 1987 through December 2012. A cost recovery team began tackling the backlog and they went combing through our cranky da database and manually reviewed records for more than 10,000 sites. In November 2013, DTSC issued sweeping procedure changes and clarified roles and responsibilities for employees. During DTSC's history, our cost recovery problems have been identified and re-identified, but only quick fixes implemented. What those drills lacked and why our solution is different now is fundamental change. For the first time, we have a standardized written process and clear roles and responsibilities. Because of the extent of our problems and the size of the task ahead, the legislature this year approved more resources, 1.6 million and 14 positions to help us attack this work. Some of those positions are what we call administrative program managers, those who are responsible for many billing tasks, leaving the technical project managers to deal with cleanup issues. Also, I was appointed by the governor to lead DTSC's cost recovery reform efforts. I started in January, and my, on my very first day, the auditors were in the building having their first recovery, cost recovery briefing. As the audit team began their investigations, DTSC was beginning to train our employees on our new procedures. That training went through February and March of this year. The auditors wrapped up their field work in the spring. In July, the two-year positions approved by the legislature took effect. We committed to analyzing all our sites by the end of the two-year term and collecting as much money as possible. On August 7th, the state auditor released its report. They included another year of data which increased our total outstanding amount to 194 million. In the future, as we report on our progress, we will use that number as a baseline. From that 94, 194 million, we've already made progress. As I noted before, we've already resolved $24 million. Also, DTSC has referred numerous cases to the Office of the Attorney General and nearly 63 million is the subject of litigation or bankruptcy action. As we continue to analyze our backlog, it is anticipated that more will end up in litigation and will result in dollars collected. In some cases, DTSC has determined that we won't be able to collect on our costs. Often, as in the Davis example, we determine that that site is an orphan. Also, we've confirmed that some sites were erroneously placed on our list and they have zero balances. We've taken those off our to-do list. We continue our site-by-site -site analysis to determine if there are more cases where it, issue, where it warrants a data cleanup response rather than cost recovery. The auditor recommended we look into whether it makes sense to write off small costs of less than $5,000. Right now, that's more than 50% of our total number of sites. Sometimes the work necessary to collect on a bill costs more than what is owed. So what do we do? We have had and we will continue to have conversations with the Department of Finance and the Comptroller's Office on when it is appropriate to write off costs. What's left then for us are 450 sites totaling $101 million. We have identified that our top priority cases should be those with val balances of $1 million and above and those with pending statutes of limitations of any amount. 
Using those priorities to guide us, we have created a list of 52 sites. We will work methodically down that list to sites of less than $1 million next. One of the audit's findings was that DTSC was unlikely to recover all of its costs. That is true, and it's also no secret. We've said this publicly from the beginning. As I explained, this may be because they are orphan sites with no viable party to collect from. It may be appropriate to write off costs. There may be mistakes that we need to clean up in a data cleanup effort. Sometimes we come to a settlement for less than the amount that is owed. We might settle because a responsible party is unable to pay the full bill. Litigation can sometimes take decades and cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, and sometimes it may be more prudent to avoid that cost. The audit did find that some of our procedures were lacking or were not followed. We'll be required to report on our progress in 60 days, in six months, and in a year. By October, the auditor recommends we establish a process to monitor and verify proper review and approval of our responsible party searches. That's the information we gather to help us determine who should pay the cleanup bill. Already, we have formed a team to revise our search procedures to include review and sign off from supervisors. Also by October, we will revise our process for updating and monitoring the log we keep on the collection letters that we send. In addition, we're setting up a tracking mechanism for statute of limitations so we don't miss the opportunities to collect. Going forward, the cost recovery team is implementing a work plan to ensure we don't repeat the mistakes of the past. Number one, we're professionalizing our procedures. As I mentioned, drafting the 26, 27 procedures has been a huge step. These are being refined now to comply with audit recommendations and employee input. After employees have a chance to work with these a bit and get the kinks out, we will issue a comprehensive cost recovery policy next year. Secondly, we are training on the new procedures. Earlier this year, we trained about 400 employees with cost recovery responsibilities. Employees with significant cost recovery responsibilities will receive further targeted training by the end of the year. And finally, we are underscoring the importance of accountability and transparency. We're creating performance metrics and will publicly report on our progress. Our next milestone will be to report to the auditor in October, and we expect to announce more accomplishments at that time. Crucial fundamental change has not only been implemented at DTSC, it has been embraced by the many committed people who are working towards the outcomes I've outlined. We've identified our problems, dramatically recast our procedures to address them, and have created timelines for resolution that will be transparent. More importantly, significant momentum has been established, and we eagerly await our, op our opportunity to report to you regarding our mission and produce the results that the people of California expect and deserve. Thank you, Terry. Excellent presentation. Um, are there any questions up here at the dais for Terry? Any questions um, from the group here um, at headquarters in the room? Got one coming, hang on. Uh, I don't have a I don't have a name. Did, did the person not want to come up and do it themselves? They want me to read it. Okay. Um, can the owner of the property be sought 
for collection prior to designating the site an orphan. Isn't the owner of the property viable as a responsible party? Okay, Stu, do you want to take a stab at that? Sure. Um, I guess the short answer to that question is yes. Um, our standard procedure is to um, evaluate ownership of the property um, under the laws, the CERCLA uh, law. We can look at properties um, on what they call joint and several liability basis. In other words, current and past owners can be approached to cover the cost of cleanup. Um, so as I said, I guess the, the short answer to that one is yes. And then the, the next part of the question is, is, isn't the owner of the property, uh, I think it's viable as the responsible party? And that would be yes also. Um, what we do as a standard procedure now, as Terry said, uh, mentioned in her presentation, what we do is at the same time, if there is an emergency situation, we will move forward with containing that emergency situation to make sure that there's no threat to human health or the environment from activities or contamination on a property. At the same time, we'll take a joint action to work with the property owners or business owner on the site to determine their financial viability to make sure that they cover the cost of, of any cleanup that is uh, required for that site. Um, as Terry mentioned, also there are sites throughout California that we encounter that have uh, either legacy or, or um, contamination that is ongoing now that have owners that cannot um, cover the cost of that cleanup because these cleanups can get very expensive. So what we do is we work with the landowner um, to find a way for them to cover as much cost as they can. Uh, they work with us from a financial situation to determine exactly how that can be done. And then we try to work out a way to either cover the entire cost, if that's possible, or a portion of the cost. Okay. Thank you. Do we have other questions from anybody here in Sacramento? Are there any questions from the webcast? Okay. Okay, well, thank you. Um, I'm going to ask Terry to come back up to the podium for our second presentation, which will be on our permitting work plan and the improvements within um, the permitting program. And after um, following uh, Terry's brief presentation, she'll be followed by Wayne Lorenzen, who's a senior engineering in our permit program. So, Terry, thank you. Thanks again. Our permitting program is an integral part of the state's effort to safely and legally manage hazardous waste. That's why I'm pleased to brief you on our efforts to enhance our permitting process. For several years, the performance of the permitting program has been the subject of much scrutiny and concern by a variety of stakeholders. As part of our Fixing the Foundation Improvement Plan, DTSC committed to more than 50 actions in response. We then, though, stepped back and took a broader look at what we wanted our permitting office to be. That result is the Permitting Enhancement Work Plan that provides us with a comprehensive roadmap for a host of reforms. We will strengthen our permitting process to be more protective and timely, embrace enforcement, bolster community input, and use more transparent standards and consistent procedures. It's an ambitious plan and a short time frame, two years. Because we have much to do and our permitting offices resources are stretched thin, we went to the legislature with our work plan. The legislature then looked at that and approved our proposal for $699,000 and five positions to help implement our work plan. We are in the process of hiring for those positions. However, DTSC has not waited to make improvements. We have completed two crucial cornerstone tasks already from that work plan. And I'd like Wayne Lorenzen, a senior engineer in our permitting office, to brief us on the details. Thanks. 
Thank you, Terry. So as Terry mentioned, I'm here to talk about what we've done so far and some key highlights on what we have planned next over the next couple of years. So we've already completed a process improvement exercise for technical reviews, and we've also done a task to map out our entire permitting process. So the first task we completed was to identify and implement solutions to reduce the amount of time it takes to complete a technical review. The Office of Permitting completes technical reviews to ensure that uh, applications submitted during our permitting process, that proposed plans meet the legal and health protective standards. So the Governor's Office of Business and Economic Development recently administered Lean Six Sigma training to build on the administration's efforts to streamline permits and make government more efficient. Lean Six Sigma is a combination of tools developed for Motorola and Toyota that focus on process improvement. So the Office of Permitting took advantage of the Governor's Office initiative to streamline government and applied the principles of process improvement and statistical analysis to streamline our own permitting process by setting a goal of 90% of technical reviews to be completed within 13 months. Riz Garagazi from the Office of Permitting, our chief, and Peter Bailey, Office of Permitting's prized senior engineering geologist, provided the expertise needed to look at the Office of Permitting in the mirror and make improvements. So we looked at historical data, and this bell curve here shows our current capability. So this shows if we didn't change anything to our process, this is, this is what our capability would look like. We would expect to complete 20% of our technical reviews within 13 months. So we analyzed the data from the technical review phase of our process to identify our most significant opportunity for improvement. And the data showed us that we currently underutilize a checklist that we developed to guide our determinations. So we are currently expanding the role of this checklist for greater transparency, standardized review, and more efficient determinations. So this is our checklist here. It's 177 pages, 1,082 checklist items, including things like engineering standards and construction specifications for the design of hazardous waste management units. This slide shows our projected capability to complete our technical reviews. By enhancing the use of this checklist, we anticipate that 80% now of technical reviews will be completed within 13 months. This checklist is available on DTSC's Office of Permitting website for those that are interested. So the next two slides show the changes that we made to reduce the time it takes to complete a technical review. This slide shows how we completed the review in the past, and I know you can't read it, but the idea here is to show you the extent of that process. This slide shows how we, we've improved our process, so how we plan to complete the technical reviews in the future. And as you can see, it's simplified significantly. So that was the first task we completed, to identify and implement solutions to reduce the amount of time it takes to complete a technical review. The second task we completed was to develop a similar process for a flow chart of our entire permitting process. From the moment the that we become aware that the facility intends to obtain a, a hazardous waste facility permit to our final permit decision and all the steps in between. So David Miller, a senior environmental scientist with our research and policy development unit and Sandy Karanen, a senior environmental scientist in our hazardous waste management program, recently led an effort 
to map out how we actually process permit applications by conducting a full day process improvement exercise that included 27 staff from DTSC offices that typically get involved in our permitting process. By assembling everyone in the same room, David and Sandy were able to deliver us a picture of our process as it actually occurs now. So this is slide one of three. This is the first of three slides. And if you can imagine the next two slides coming in sequential order to the right of this picture. This is slide one. And, uh, and again, it's unreadable, but the idea is to show the complexity of our process. This is part two. And this is part three. So that's the second task we completed mapping our entire permitting process. So we will use this as a baseline to identify delays or inefficiencies so that we can improve our procedures in the future. So we're not finished improving yet. We will partner with the governor's office again to continue the administration's efforts to make government more efficient by training more of our staff in the statistical analysis and process improvement aspects in Lean Six Sigma. So we've already started a second phase of improvements using Lean Six Sigma, where we will begin looking at the entire permitting process. Amber Harmon and Mushta Faroz of our Berkeley and Sacramento offices and our engineers that are currently gathering data to identify our most significant opportunity for improvement in the time it takes us to process permit decisions. And we plan to complete that by the end of this year. We are confident that we can maintain the highest level of protection of public health and the environment in making permit decisions while reducing unnecessary delays. By doing so, we will add additional strength to our public outreach efforts because we believe that permit conditions are not, not just about meeting the legal standards, they're not just about meeting enforcement and health protective standards, but they're also about listening to community concerns and stakeholder input. So we're looking at ways to begin public outreach efforts earlier in our process so that we can collaborate with communities and stakeholders earlier. In addition to the Lean Six Sigma work, we are committed to completing several key initiatives over the next two years. As Terry mentioned, the California legislature has given us additional positions to implement the work plan. So we will be creating a team of staff from our permitting, legal, and enforcement office to draft guidance that details specific roles and responsibilities that staff have when issuing notices of deficiency or denying or revoking permits. The Office of Permitting issues notices of deficiency for applications that have problems, errors, incomplete information, or other issues such as inadequate design of hazardous waste management units. The Office of Permitting expects the applicant to send back a revision to us in a timely manner that meets regulatory and statutory standards. So we will look at the types of documents and deficiencies that trigger notices of deficiency and the consequences for repeated deficiencies. To add clarity to our process, we'll also draft guidance that describes the violations that justify a basis for denying or revoking a permit. Permitting and legal and enforcement experts will draft the language and add it to our permit writer's manual to ensure consistency and transparency across all permit decisions. That permit writer's manual, manual is also available on our website, on the Office of Permitting website. Another example key initiative we will complete in the next two years concerns financial assurance. We will create a process to update and modify existing protocols to calculate whether financial assurance is adequate to protect human health and the environment and ensure any release of financial assurance funds meets closure and corrective action requirements to ensure that money is available for cleanups and closure. 
We will also create a similar process to include information in disclosure statements concerning violations, compliance orders, convictions, and judgments into our permit decisions. Finally, we have key initiatives to expand the information we provide to the public about permit decisions and create a more robust public engagement process. Nikita Karate, a new member of our work plan team, will provide more detail about these initiatives later in this meeting. So we look forward to implementing this work plan over the next two years. And we're also excited about listening to the feedback about, about our permitting program from the community and stakeholders, because it helps us understand what is important to them and where we can improve most effectively. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you, Terry. That was very helpful. Um, do we have questions from anybody up here? Any questions from folks here in Sacramento? Yes, no? Just what, we have one question here. Excuse me, I'm Linda Bunyan with DTSC. I'm not going to stand. I have my notes on my lap. I question, probably everyone in the room knows except me, but what is the Six Sigma Phase Two? <laughs> sounds like a fraternity, but it sounds like a maybe fraternity. a sorority. <laughs> Wayne. <laughs> Thank you for the question. The Lean Six Sigma is a combination of efforts. Lean is a, um, they're both actually process improvement uh, mechanisms. So the governor's office introduced a combination of the tools to streamline government. Our phase two, instead of looking at the technical review phase of our process, we've expanded it to look at our entire permitting process. So we're gonna start from the very beginning, as soon as we know that an application is coming in the door, all the way to the time that we make a final permit decision. And we're going to look at ways to improve our process and reduce the time it takes for us to make those decisions. Great. Thank you. And I don't have any comment. Do I have a comment card? Question. Hello, I'm Phil Retallick with Clean Harbors. Pleasure to be here today. I have a question concerning whether or not the DTSC benchmarked its permitting program against other states in, in the United States to see if there were any innovative act procedures or policies or ideas that those states uh, have already implemented that could help California. I'll ask Rizgar Ghazi to help with that answer. Rizgar? Good morning, Phil. Good. Uh, yes, we, we have looked at what other states do. In fact, uh, when we first started this process, we looked at what other states, uh, their timeline for issuing a permit. DTSC has always been below the national average for issuing a permit. The national average, I believe, is a little over five years, and DTSC was a little less than that. Um, however, that wasn't good enough for the state of California. We wanted to go back and see how we could improve the processes, how we process the permit from what that, uh, when we talked about the review of the technical uh, aspects of the permit application and from end, from beginning to end. Um, we have consulted with other states and we got some data and, and looked at how, how different states are doing and that is part of the discussions we have internally. Uh, yeah. Another question? So Don Chase from Lawrence Livermore Lab. Um, curious how this affects the renewal process. So you're talking about new permits here, but we have a lot of permits out there that are in renewal. Is this going to speed up those processes as well? Are we still looking at 13 months for technical review, et cetera? Well, the goal of this whole permitting process is to get our permits um, from an average of 4.3, 4.4 years to about two years for most permits to get them out the door. So that is what we have told the legislature, and so as permits are coming in the door now, you know, they will start to get the benefit as we apply, you know, this new technical review process um, through it. So it depends on where you are in the process, how much of the benefits uh, you will reap through um, the permit review process. But that is the goal, is that 
um, you know, all of the permits that come through the state of California will be done in uh, two years instead of the four point whatever it is that is currently taking us. Thank you. Other questions on this topic? I think we have one more. So on um, David Nielsen with Clean Harbor. So on permit renewals, not taking into account landfills, uh, and there's no, assuming there's no changes to a permit renewal, can it be sped up anyway without going through uh, a very critical review like a new one would? I'm going to have Rizgar come back up. Good morning, David. Uh, yes, so for a permit renewal, you'd assume that the permit conditions haven't changed, the facility operation hasn't changed, unless there's changes of the facility operation, like addition of new, un new units and different operations that you want to take on, then it'd be, it would be considered as, a, as almost like a new permit. However, the goal is for the permit renewal is the process would be much faster than a new facility walking in the door. That's the intent. What the average, what uh, Wayne talked about, uh, excuse me, the director talked about the 2.3 uh, years to uh, process a permit. That's an average for all the permits that we have uh, in the state of California. There are some permits will be issued less than uh, within 12 months, and some the landfills will take a lot longer than two years, the more complex facilities. Great. Did we have any questions from the webcast? Wonderful, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Um, thank you, Terry and Wayne, again. Um, our next presen presentation is on steps we've taken to improve the tracking of hazardous waste in California. And Rick Brausch, our Chief of Policy and Program Support in the Hazardous Waste Program, um, oversees the tracking and has already taken several steps to improve how we track, review, and evaluate the data we receive from hazardous waste manifests. As you'll recall, this was the initial uh, systematic shortfall that we discovered in early 2011. And much has been done to fix this system already, and more work is on the horizon. Thanks to additional resources um, that we received in the budget, we look forward to significant improvements in the near future, and Rick is going to provide us with an update on where we are. Thank you, Rick. Great. Thank you. Um, Appreciate the opportunity to update you on some of the exciting things that are happening with our hazardous waste tracking system. With the 2013 Hazardous Waste Management Program reorganization, I now have the privilege of overseeing the, the group that manages this system, and I found it to be one of the most innovative and dedicated groups in the department that I've experienced, and I'm pleased to provide this update on their behalf. In the presentation, I plan to give you a brief overview of the system, our current efforts to improve the system, including new, the use of our newly budgeted resources, and so what's on the horizon, what's, for, what's the future hold for hazardous waste tracking system. So what is the hazardous waste tracking system? It's the DTSE information system that houses all of the information related to hazardous waste handlers in California, as well as all the shipments of hazardous waste that originate in California. We've had a system like this since the mid-1980s, beginning with the Hazardous Waste Information System. For those of you who have been around that long, it was a green screen of, of information that you would have limited terminals that you could go and, and access this. The current system that we're operating was built uh, and be, was implemented in 2002. The information that's in this system is contains, it contains both images and data from all of the manifests that are originated in and uh, end up in California. There are over 450,000 shipments of hazardous waste each year, so all of those shipments, all that information gets placed into the system. It also contains information from over 110,000 generators of hazardous waste that are in California. It contains information about our 950 registered hazardous waste transporters, and it contains information about California's 117 hazardous waste facilities, as well as uh, approximately 50 out-of-state facilities to which our California generators ship their hazardous waste. And California is only one of a handful of states that actually operates a system like this. Most other states that are, have much smaller operation and much smaller footprint actually still use those paper copies and look in boxes for their information. So we are actually one of the more innovative 
uh, we can compare to states like uh, New York and Illinois with respect to the operation of the system. A just an image of a manifest, it is a paper document and it contains multiple parts and there was a prop I was going to give with all sorts of fun throwing of papers, uh, which the director did in a legislative hearing. I chose not to go that route. <laughs> I, you can't up her and there's no way I'm going to try. So, uh, but again, it, it is a paper copy and again, as you might imagine in Marvel 2014, we're still using a paper copy, which is no carbon required paper. So it, again, it has the appearance of, looks very much like, and is uh, a very antiquated system, but it is the system we have. And for that reason, we, have, we operate a data system in order to translate all of these many pieces of paper into useful information. So again, we use this, inform this, this system to allow us to verify that each shipment of hazardous waste that originates in California is received by the, the proper legal receiving facility which is known as the cradle to grave system. We're able to track using these paper documents a receipt of each, each person who touches those shipments of hazardous waste. So in addition to this verification, the information in the system is also useful to our enforcement program. We, do, we use the data to prepare for inspections so that we understand what a, each facility and generator is doing. We can anticipate that what types of waste they are handling, what types of waste that they aren't showing, which we might be able to understand, uh, they might be mismanaging. And again, with each of these images of information, uh, or each of these, all right, I'm going to apologize because this is the former presentation. So um, this was a, I took out a lot of this information. So I've, I'm reading off of a streamlined presentation. My apologies. So I will try to sync this up. Um, the enforcement program also uses the, each of the images for uh, evidence for their enforcement cases. Each of these signed documents, the images of those, becomes the evidence of a transaction that generators, uh, transporters, and facilities can be held legally accountable for through the signature and certification. The information in the system is also useful for assessing and assigning fees. The data, the, the waste quantities, the waste types all relate to the types and amounts of, of fees that are due and owed by generators and other handlers of hazardous waste. And the information in the system is used by our Board of Equalization in order to assess those fees and to audit those fee payers. It's also, also useful for research. From the system and from all of the data we take from the manifests, we can determine what types of hazardous waste are generated in California each year how much hazardous waste is being generated, and by whom. And we can also find out how this year's hazardous waste generation compares to previous years, so we can understand trends, we can understand and potentially forecast future, future types of waste management issues that are coming uh, in the fu well, future, coming in the future, that would make sense. Um, sorry about that. Um, so the challenges that the director indicated, um, we have known for some time that HWTS has challenges. We've known that the system's aging. 2002, this, the language that the system was written in is no longer supported by software manufacturers. So we are have, have a significant vulnerability in the system through that um, through just its uh, coding. We've also known about the issues with data quality. Um, we have had significant. In fact, it seems like if, if you've been around that long, the issues with data quality have existed with this system since th its inception. The idea that information handwritten on a paper form by people who may or may not have an interest in the data quality would then get translated into a data system. There are many layers of that that can lead to errors in the system and the errors compromise the utility and the value of the data. And as, we, as was mentioned, as we discovered with the Western Environmental Site in, in Mecca, we discovered a, the significant disconnects between the system and the use of the system and the data in the system with our programs. So there are a number of uh, improvements that have, we've already begun. Uh, in 2012 and 2013, uh, we began to take action to try to address some of these things. So we didn't wait until we had resources. We began immediately as soon as we discovered. The manifest en enforcement coordinator position was reestablished in 2012 in order to put eyes back onto this data to find out what we could find out. The issue with Western Environmental could have easily been found had we been looking at the data. 
So therefore, we put eyes back on it to get a regular report, routinely look and see if we can find those glaringly obvious issues. Again, uh, Hazardous Waste Management Program was also reorganized in 2013 to bring the system and its operation back in line with the major program to which it supports and relates. So the Hazardous Waste Management Program containing the Hazardous Waste Tracking System was a natural connection in order, in that way we could establish priorities and help to understand and manage the system in light of the, the data users that, that have uh, the need for the system. And in 2012 and 13, we also began the process of acquiring additional resources. Uh, we, we began to write a feasibility study report in order to make the significant changes related to the system and the system's design and, and re rebuild. And we also began to draft budget change proposals. So in 2013 and 14 then, we also focused on it, ways in which rather than wait for resources to get to us because the budget process does take time for those of you who haven't experienced that. Um, so we began changes internally with the, using existing resources to prepare us for making those significant changes as well as to take advantage of some of, a, some of the attention and some of the knowledge we were gaining from the problem definitions. So we looked to, to improvements in our hazardous waste tracking system reports. How do we get, how do we tease information out of the system using its existing capabilities to give inspectors and others greater tools and effective tools for, for use for doing their jobs. We also look to enhancements in our generator uh, online verification process. How do we increase the efficiency and effectiveness and ease of use by generators who have to annually verify their identification number. And we also looked at ways in which we could enhance our online permanent ID issuance system. So a couple of these processes did not pan out as well as we had hoped because of some limitations, but we did make significant progress towards um, at least making the improvements we could and setting us up for the next stages of improvements. The other significant effort we undertook was a business process analysis where we looked at this system. We went out and talked to all of the data users, the people who need this information, who access this information on a daily or routine basis to, tr to determine what sort of capabilities need to be in the system in order to help them do their jobs better. So this business process analysis was our effort to really look at this disconnect between the system and the data users to help begin to map it back together. If this system could be made to improve and, and become a better tool, how would we do that? What sort of capability would be most useful and beneficial to people in our programs as well as to people outside of our programs in our regulatory partners, the COOPAs, as well as in the regulated industry. In 2014, we then with the budget, we got additional resources. We, we got $1.4 million to rebuild the hazardous waste tracking system, which we will use to, um, to uh, hire a contractor to do that redesign. And we also got uh, nearly a half a million dollars to hire additional staff which we plan to use to, um, to affect change to the errors in the error correction. Um, the, so we're now ready to begin implementing those. Uh, for the hazardous waste tracking system rebuild project, um, this past month, uh, our Office of Environmental Information Management System, our program, they hired a new project manager to help lead us through this effort. So with the help of a, a new project manager working together with us as a program, we hope to be able to make significant progress in that redesign. Uh, over the next three months, we hope to have a request for offer out on the street so that we can get that system integrator uh, in place as quickly as we can. And over the next year then, over th through 2015, our plan is to work with that system integrator to help redesign, uh, redesign, build, and then test the system. Our primary goal in that is to maintain capability and functionality through this. We cannot lose the capability of the system through any downtime. So the idea is to seamlessly move from a redesign into implementation in a way that gives us continued capability and capacity. For the error correction process, our goal is to increase the rate of error correction. For the for the positions that we have, we were allocated, we're in the process of recruiting, we hope to have that completed soon. Um, one quick note, we estimate that approximately 10% of all manifests that we receive have some sort of error on them. 
So obviously 10% error rate in a system of this, of this size is a fairly significant number of errors. So these three and a half positions coupled with the one and a half positions we currently had dedicated to the error correction, we hope to be able to make significant headway, at least with those that are currently being made. We also hope to the extent we can gain efficiencies at looking back to see if we can correct some of the previous or historic issues and errors. In order to also affect behavior change, we're also looking at education and outreach efforts. How do we prevent the errors from being created in the first place? We've begun a process where we've reached out to manifest users to help them understand that it is, it is they who, where the, it is them who, they're the ones who cause the errors. Um, sorry about that. Uh, so basically, it's their handwriting, it's their legibility, it's the information they put on the, the manifest, it's their use of tons versus pounds versus gallons, it's, uh, it's their use of decimal points, which can actually create significant issues and challenges. Um, and we've also reminded them that we have the authority to assess a $20 fee for the correction of any manifest. But at the same time, we've also reminded them that if they tell us about their error before we find it, they don't get charged the fee. So they, again, we tried to kind of instill in them the motivation to help change the behavior and help to improve the system. Anything less than 10% gives us the ability to look backwards and, and, and do more error correction from in previous. We're also working with our, um, with our external contractor to develop an automated uh, uh, error correction letter system so that when the information is brought into the system, it automatically generates an error correction letter so that we can immediately begin the process of, of getting the errors corrected in the system. And we hope to have the system in full-scale implementation by November of 2014. Some additional improvements we're looking at beyond then, it, it, um, beyond the allocation and the, and the work with the resources we've been given, is to look at additional improvements that we can make. How can we build on the success of staff innovation? How can we build on those things that we've already begun? Again, our goal here is to expand the use of, knowledge, of data for intelligence. How do we use this valuable resource in order to help us do our jobs more effectively? We want it to be able to take advantage of the power of information and technology. That's one of the most key and integral failures or downsides of the system we currently have is that it has so many limits based on the data quality that it takes so much time to manipulate and, and work with the data to actually tease out the errors that are in it that you have very little capability of using it to project, to be able to forecast, to be able to see where a data system of this size and this power could bring you. So our job and our goal here is how do we make this system work for us, reduce staff time that's necessary so we can dedicate staff time to those areas where we can protect public health and the environment. We also plan to expand our automated and online systems. We, our hope is to bring us into the 21st century. Um, we figure that if DMV can do this, I think we can. I, it's, a, it's a lofty goal, and I, not a lot of promises here, but I, that, that's our, that is a, it's a goal. How do, in, ultimately, our goal is to improve the integration of this system into the work we do. How do we make this a tool that's effective and useful for our staff? Some additional things on the horizon I'm sure all of you have heard about, if not uh, um, read some issues related to federal e-manifesting. The federal government has identified electronic manifesting as one of its goals for the, for the future. Um, again, although for the future, it's been on their books and on their horizon since 2002. Uh, our hope is that someday eventually they're able to accomplish their goal. Um, they have a targeted completion date of 2015 uh, funding dependent, I'm not sure that they're going to be able to accomplish that. We're going to continue our efforts in regardless of EPA's efforts. At the end of the day, ha our hazardous waste tracking system improvements will be needed regardless of what the federal government does. So although on one end we have our error correction and uh, data input issues that we have with our system right now, our hope is through e-manifesting, which allows manifest and data and and hazardous waste handlers to input data directly into the system. Our hope would then be to inter just integrate the federal data into our system and be able to use it as one large tool. If, however, they're not successful, we still have the ability and we're maintaining the capability of operating our system un until and unless they come up with their own system. Whether or not we can then move ourselves away from paper, that's another challenge that 
uh, we'll have to take on then. We are working very closely with EPA though. As being one of the handful of states that operates a system like this, they are looking to us and relying on us for our experiences. Again, since mid-1980s, we've been operating a system like this. Their, their hope is to glean as much information as they can from us. Our hope is that they learn from the lessons we've learned instead of dragging us back through the same lessons we learned once again. Uh, and again, our, our goal with the working with EPA is to ensure that we maintain our functionality. How do we ensure that we continue to be able to do, do and use this system for the purposes for which we find it valuable and important for our, for our regulatory purposes? So with that, an exciting future for HWTS. I appreciate the opportunity again to update you. My apologies for the slide unsync, uh, and I'd ha be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Rick, for the update. Do we have any questions up here? Questions here in Sacramento? And questions on the web? Thank you so much, Rick. I appreciate all of the work you guys are doing. It's an important area for lots of different aspects of our department, so I really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, our next presentation is going to be from Nikita Karate, and she is our former executive fellow and is now with us um, in the Office of Program Review. Um, and she will be doing a presentation on our Fixing the Foundation update um, and a review of where we've, what we've done in the last year. So, Nikita. Thank you, Miriam. So the department began a review of its systems and processes in 2012 after concerns arose about the hazardous waste tracking system, cost recovery, permitting, and other programs. We realized that while quick fixes had been implemented for a number of these programs in the 90s and early 2000s, real and permanent solutions required a thorough analysis and foundational improvements. So in 2013, a list of 36 issues were identified and prioritized. Were identified and prioritized. We then developed work plans that spelled out concrete improvements and publicly tracked our progress. Recently, we posted a one-year update report detailing the actions that were successfully completed as well as those that still require further attention. You've already heard from my colleagues about much of this progress, particularly in cost recovery, permitting, and the hazardous waste tracking system. But we also improved, at the same time, a number of internal and administrative processes. So for example, we balanced our budget. We resolved personnel misallocation issues. We updated exam exams and training and we're ensuring that all staff are held accountable through timely performance appraisals. While fixing the foundation represented an important milestone for the department, it, does, it is not the end of our road to improvement. What follows is a quick snapshot of some of the department's commitments for the next six and 12 months. Again, we went through the process of systematically creating these public work plans, which can now be found on our website, to encourage department-wide consistency, transparency, and accountability. So as Terry discussed earlier, DTSC has already made significant progress in creating and maintaining strong, sustainable, and transparent cost recovery systems, from updating our DPMs, to issuing a comprehensive policy, to ensuring that our IT infrastructure is improved. This will help DTSC maximize its recovery of past, present, and future cleanup response costs. DTSC's Enforcement and Emergency Response Division, among other responsibilities, conducts inspections and takes enforcement actions to ensure compliance with California's hazardous ways laws and regulations. We also, we also provide emergency response to hazardous materials related emergencies throughout the state. In April 2014, DTSC launched user-friendly enhancements to its EnviroStore database to provide the public with the detailed information on inspections and enforcement actions at permitted hazardous waste facilities. So in an effort to continue to make our enforcement activities more accessible to the public and more transparent, enforcement staff have initiated a pilot project to determine how to best seek public comment on DTSC enforcement cases and settlements before they're finalized. So program staff have already begun drafting a project plan, which will be further informed by input that's currently being gathered from community members, industry, and NGOs. 
Additionally, DTSC will be focusing on emergency response planning to better train DTSC staff to provide immediate assistance to local emergency response teams as mandated by the state's emergency plan. Contingent on securing necessary funding, DTSC will be identifying and training multidisciplinary teams of technical and support staff to provide quick and effective inf um, emergency response assistance to a hazardous materials release or spill or another large scale emergency like localized flooding or a wildfire or a major rail catastrophe. So this is a really important effort for us. Our Brownfields and Environmental Restoration Program, also known as our cleanup program, safeguards communities by investigating and cleaning up contaminated properties. The first work plan within site cleanup is to ensure that the long-term monitoring and tracking of cleanup and corrective action sites adequately protect public health and the environment. So program staff are currently finalizing revised policies and procedures for land use covenants, which essentially limit what can happen on a given site to prevent or at least minimize human exposure to residual contamination that may remain on site after a cleanup. Relatedly, DTSC continues to strengthen the financial assurance system within the cleanup program. And financial assurance um, essentially refers to the requirement that owners and operators of hazardous waste facilities maintain adequate financial resources to pay for things like closure, maintenance and monitoring, and the proper decommissioning and decontamination of facilities. The cleanup program has new, financial, has new policies and procedures as well as an action plan in place to implement new and revised financial assurance programs as sites reach their correct, correct cleanup or corrective action stage. Um, the goal is to complete 40% of this work by the end of this year and nearly 100% of the work by next June. Oh, sorry. And finally, the department is continuing its fixing the foundation efforts to take quick and effective enforcement actions at sites where responsible parties underperform. So program staff continue to evaluate underperforming or priority one sites where there's a substantial threat to human health or the environment. And then they determine what the appropriate enforcement tool is and apply it accordingly to ensure compliance with the law. Terry and Wayne have already discussed some of the comprehensive process improvements that are currently being implemented within the permitting program. What I'd like to expand on are some of the community engagement and environmental justice enhancements within the new work plan. <clears throat> so to better inform the public of DTSC's progress in processing permits, we will soon begin posting quarterly and easy to understand summaries of permit activity at each facility on the website. Similarly, recognizing that a lot of the work that we do can be fairly complex, we will design a community workshop process to inform the public and stakeholders about the permitting process, some of the mechanics, what to expect, and what their roles and responsibilities will look like. We will also be reviewing and revising how we gather and incorporate public recommendations into our final decisions. Communities often feel at a disadvantage because of the technical nature of our work and because we may not always adequately demonstrate how or if we considered their input. So in addition to early public involvement and early consultation, we will be improving the way we reflect public input in our final decisions. And finally, an innovative effort within the permitting work plan is to design and implement an enhanced review procedure for facilities that are located in communities that are disproportionately burdened by multiple pollution sources and vulnerabilities. This review could include a list of all the potential environmental health concerns that are relevant to a particular community, such as air pollution or groundwater contamination, and then see if there are any mitigation measures that can be incorporated into a permit condition or another document to help address these concerns. DTSC, actually, sorry. In addition to, um, in addition to some of these protections that are in the permitting work plan, DTSC will be partnering with the Professional Community Involvement Organization to conduct and facilitate statewide outreach 
to talk to the public. And our, and our hope is basically to look at our current public engagement practices as a whole and really identify opportunities for improvement and see where we can modernize our efforts to better inform and involve the communities that are most affected by our decisions. So where can we take advantage of new communication tools to better identify the relevant environmental health concerns and communities that are disproportionately burdened? What is an assessment process that really gets to the heart of a community's concerns look like? How do we tailor outreach to address cross-media concerns and so forth? The Office of Communications will also be working to make our website and our social media tools more useful, accessible, and reflective of the needs of the public. So this involves not only taking down up outdated or inaccurate documents on the web, but also improving the way we do content management, and identifying and then utilizing the best social media tools to communicate effectively with the public. Ultimately, we want to be able to tailor how we do community outreach to involve communities in the process, give them a forum to dis more, accurate, more effectively discuss, participate, and even question our decisions. DTSC will also be replacing its aging financial systems and transitioning how we do our budgeting and accounting and other processes into the new financial information system for California, also known as FISCAL. This is a fairly complex effort, and so we're currently redirecting resources to make sure that we can make a smooth transition to FISCAL by July of 2015. Among other things, FISCAL is expected to help us improve the way we do cost recovery tracking and billing, so furthering the overall cost recovery effort that Terry discussed earlier. And finally, as for our Safer Products and Workplaces program, work plans are currently being developed to ensure that the Safer Consumer Products regulations are successfully implemented so that we can continue to reduce the presence of toxic chemicals in the products that we buy and use. The department is currently creating a guidance document to assist stakeholders in their preparation of alternatives analyses, which manufacturers will use to identify potential alternatives to harmful chemicals in what we call priority products. So the goal is really to assist businesses and come up with new tools to increase their awareness of compliance requirements. Additionally, we're currently developing a three-year work plan that will identify the product categories that DTSC will research over the next three years, and future priority products may be chosen from these categories. Simultaneously, the three initial proposed priority products that were announced by DTSC in April of this year um, are planned to be adopted into regulation but following California's rulemaking process. So in conclusion, the Fixing the Foundation initiative and ongoing work plan development really represent the department's commitment to avoiding the quick fix approach that we've talked about throughout the public meeting and really aiming for sy systematic and systemic process improvements. This effort really gave us the opportunity to develop a framework for not only identifying when and where these process improvements are needed, but also it, it uh, can display to us the importance of tracking our progress and also of priori prioritizing our commitments in order to create this real and lasting change and build strong systems for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Nikita. Um, that was an excellent presentation. And I just wanted to um, highlight just one thing before I open it up to um, questions from folks, and that is, uh, again, to, to highlight the importance of the work that we are doing on the community outreach program within the department as a whole, but specifically with environmental justice communities, and not only in the permitting arena, but across the department. And to that end, I am really excited to be able to inform you all that um, we have received approval from the governor's office as well as the secretary to establish an assistant director for environmental justice here at the Department of Toxic Substances Control and that we are actively recruiting to fill that position and that I am working with the assistant secretary for environmental justice at Cal EPA um, to look for candidates to fill that position as soon as we possibly can 
And again, it is just that we recognize that environmental justice communities are home to some of our most complicated permitting, enforcement, and cleanup sites, and that these communities both um, deserve our attention and that we are committed to bringing about meaningful change and facilitating um, constructive dialogue that improves the environment in the areas that they live and work in. And so again, this is really signaling that change and that fundamental foundational shift in where this department is and where it is heading. And I'm also pleased to say that in addition to um, Roger Kintz that many of you know that has worked on environmental justice issues in this department for a long time, we'll, we have um, Nikita Karate who has been, who will be working, who just did this wonderful presentation, will be working um, on the, the uh, the permitting work plan implementation on specifically the environmental justice and the community outreach components of, um, of the implementation. So again, I just wanted to take this opportunity at the end of your, your presentation to, to really highlight that it isn't just, yes, we're, we want to engage the community, but we are taking concrete and real steps above and beyond these work plans that this is a concrete step and it is going all the way up to the governor's office and to the office of the secretary and that we're putting um, some serious resources in to make this a reality and um, I'm very excited uh, about that change. So um, having said that, I uh, am wondering if there are any questions about the foundational presentation um, and the six and 12 month work plans that um, that are ahead of us. So the work that we've done already or what's ahead of us? Yeah, hi, uh, my name is David Nielsen with Clean Harbors again. Um, in the presentation, she mentioned something about strengthening financial assurance arrangements. And um, my question is, is what do you mean by strengthening financial assurance? And then uh, are you finding that for existing TSDFs that the financial assurance is not adequate at this time, or just kind of wondering what the overall bigger issue is that. And then when it comes to the public relations, environmental justice, um, I know we talked about the amount of time it takes to do a, a permit renewal, but it seems like the public participation takes longer than the technical review. It also seems to be more difficult and is there any way you can start that process earlier so that the permits don't take so long to be issued? Okay, great. So with respect to the financial assurance, I'm going to answer part of it and then I'm going to pass it to Stu. And then with permitting, I'll probably do the same. Um, well, not to Stu, I'll pass it. <laughs> um, so with respect to the financial assurance, we are looking to make sure that the financial assurance is reviewed um, every five years and making sure that it is sufficient and current. And I don't know that that was exactly what you had asked. And then with respect, and so I'll let um, Stu answer the rest of your question. And then with respect to the permitting review process, that really long three-page chart of the process on how you get to a permit, in there, there was a line for the public participation piece. And we do recognize that, and that was one of the things that, um, that Nikita had mentioned as well. Yes, we are recognizing how do we bring in the public participation process in sooner into the permit? Is there a way to bring it in perhaps earlier and maybe at the same time as some of these other activities? And how to make their, their participation um, more meaningful? And so this is, part of that big chart that um, Wayne put up early on, and it is part of that conversation that we're gonna have. How do we make it a more meaningful and more efficient process? Um, and I don't know if there's anything you would want to add. If you do, let me know, and um, after Stu answers the financial assurance question, I'll let you chime in. Yeah, just to add a little bit to your financial assurance question and to your answer, it's, um, as with Rick's program, our program was working with some fairly antiquated models and systems um, for cost estimations for whether it's corrective action or cleanup sites. Um, 
and we actually had some attrition because of retirements and so on. And we have decided that what we really need to do is we need to make sure that we're using up-to-date systems for estimating so that we're, because I'm sure your consultants are using those systems, we need to make sure we're apples and apples with the facilities or with the, the um, cleanup entity that's doing it or the project proponents. Um, so we've moved forward with, with updating those systems, and I believe we've completed that update. Uh, we may still need to buy one or two new programs. But um, so we're ready to go on that. We have implemented training for new staff and actually hired some new staff to replace the staff that we had to make sure that we have the not only the, capa the capability but the capacity to deal with the financial assurance. We, we took a look and... Um, we noticed that we really need to be updating these on a regular basis. We need to make sure that the numbers are correct, not only for our standpoint to make sure that if the costs have gone up or if something new happens because of a five-year review, but for your standpoint um, or our stakeholder standpoint, because if they've put work into something and they've completed it, we need to make sure that any financial assurance we have goes back to them to reflect the work that they've done. So that, that's the main focus of what we're doing right now. I just wanted to add that there's some things about the public process that we can't change. I, like the public comment period, there's statutory uh, requirements for that. So, But we are looking at ways that we can build um, engagement with the community earlier in the process so that they're more prepared when we go out with a draft decision. Great, thank you. Do we have other questions here in Sacramento? How about to the internet, to the web? All right. I think we have Josh next. Our final presentation is a legislative update from Josh Tooker, our legislative director. He'll discuss the key bills um, which are pending before the governor right now that if signed into law uh, would impact DTSC. Josh? Thank you, Marion. Good morning. The legislative session ended August 31st, and DTSC tracked over 150 bills in 2014, ranging from bills affecting all government agencies to those affecting DTSC directly. The governor has until September 30th to sign or veto the bills on his desk. Many of these bills that DTSC tracked did not make it to the governor. And this morning, I will discuss four of these bills, which are currently pending action before the governor. SB 72 by 712 by Senator Lara. This bill requires DTSC, on or before December 31st, 2015, to issue a final permit decision on an application for a hazardous waste facilities permit that is submitted by a facility operating under a grant of interim status on or before January 1, 1986, by either issuing a final permit or a final denial of the application. This bill specifies if a person petitions DTSC for review of a final permit decision to approve a hazardous waste facilities permit or a facility currently operating under interim status, then the interim status shall not terminate until final administrative disposition of the petition, even if final administrative dis disposition occurs after December 31st, 2015. SB 712 provides that any interim status granted for a hazardous waste facility shall terminate five years from the date on which the status was granted. SB 712 allows DTSC to temporarily suspend the operation of a facility operating under a continued permit or an interim status grant in order to protect public health or safety or the environment. DTSC will have specified timelines to notify the owner and operator of the facility, set a hearing to consider the suspension, and to make a final determination. The next bill is SB 812 by Senator DeLeon. This bill requires DTSC to adopt regulations by January 1, 2017 to specify conditions for new permits and the renewal of existing permits and establishes deadlines for the submission and processing of facility permit applications. This bill requires the owner or operator of a facility su to submit a complete Part A and Part B application for a permit renewal at least two years prior to the expiration date of the permit. 
SB 812 requires DTSC to issue a final permit decision for an application for permit renewal within 36 months of the expiration of the facility's permit. SB 812 deems an application for permit renewal be denied if a final permit decision has not been issued for the application within that time period. This bill requires DTSC to request an owner or operator of a hazardous waste facility to submit to DTSC for review and approval a written cost estimate to cover activities associated with corrective action based on available data, history of releases, and site activities. SB 812 requires the owner or operator to submit the corrective action cost estimate to DTSC within 60 days of DTSC's request and requires the owner or operator within 90 days of the approval of the corrective action cost estimate to fund the cost estimate or enter into a schedule of compliance for assurances of financial responsibility for completing the corrective action. SB 812 establishes the DTSC Community Oversight Committee and requires the committee to make recommendations to DTSC to increase public participation in and the transparency of DTSC's decision making and to serve as a resource and liaison for communities and residents in communication with DTSC. This bill requires the committee to be comprised of 13 members, four appointed by the Senate Rules Committee, four appointed by the Speaker of the Assembly, and five appointed by the Secretary of the California Environmental Protection Agency. SB 812 requires DTSC by July 1, 2017 to develop and implement programmatic reforms designed to improve the protectiveness, timeliness, legal defensibility, and enforceability of DTSC's permitting program. SB 1019 by Senator Leno. This bill requires upholstered furniture to include on a label that is already required by law to indicate whether the product has added flame retardant chemicals. The bill directs the Bureau of Electronic and Appliance Repair, Home Furnishings, and Thermal Insulation to ensure compliance with labels and documentation and to assess fines for violations. SB 1019 requires the Bureau to provide DTSC with a selection of samples from covered products marked contain no added flame retardant chemicals for testing for the presence of added flame retardant chemicals. The Bureau shall select samples based on consultation with DTSC, taking into account a range of manufacturers and types of covered products. DTSC shall provide the results of any completed test to the Bureau. This bill requires the Bureau to reimbur reimburse DTSC for the cost of testing for the presence of added flame retardant chemicals in covered products. And finally, SB 1249 by Senator Hill. This bill requires DTSC to prepare an analysis evaluating the hazardous waste management activities at metal shredder facilities. SB 1249 authorizes DTSC to adopt regulations establishing management standards for hazardous waste management activities at metal shredding facilities until January 1, 2018. SB 1249 states that all hazardous waste determinations, policies, procedures, or guidance issued by DTSC before January 1, 2014, governing treated metal shredder waste to be inoperative if or when DTSC completes its analysis and either adopts new regulations establishing alternative management standards or rescinds the existing conditional waste classifications. This bill sunsets DTSC's authority to adopt regulations relating to metal shredder waste on January 1, 2018. And SB 1249 authorizes DTSC to collect an annual fee from all metal shredding facilities that are subject to regulation to cover DTSC's cost for implementation. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Do we have any questions from anybody here in Sacramento? Phil? Oh, sorry. Here? So do we like SB 8112, all of those decision-making features and a legislative committee, I'm not quite sure the whole breadth of that. And then also the 1249 metal shredders, uh, seems like we would like that and gives us 2017-18 uh, to uh, really have that in place. So, so a little bit more description on those and how those pieces of legislation affect us or if we like that or we're with them we hope the governor signs them so those are my questions the um of those four bills they're all pending on the governor's desk at this point the only measure that we had um 
an approved position on was SB 812. It was on a previous version of the bill, and it was an opposed unless amended position. The author took some of our um, amendments, but not all of them. And so <coughs> the governor is currently weighing the, um, the, the bills now. So we have weighed in with the governor, but at this point they're, they're on his, his desk. So we, we don't have, we can't discuss those at this point. Well, Phil Retallick with Clean Harbors again. Uh, our company has written the governor on SBA 12, recommending that he oppose the legislation and veto it. And it's a very simple decision on his part because it's unconstitutional. I don't know if the Attorney General's office has weighed in in the discussion about this, but since you're a delegated state program under RICRA, uh, you've got to comply with the federal statutes, both in RICRA, but also the federal statutes that deal with uh, federally authorized or permitted uh, licenses and permits and permit renewals. And it says clearly in the federal statute, 5 U.S. Code Section 558, that when the licensee has made timely and sufficient application for a renewal, or a new license in accordance with agency rules, a license with reference to an activity of a continuing nature does not expire until the application has been finally determined by the agency. And that has been recodified into RICRA under 40 CFR Part 271. So Josh, I just wanna, wanted to reinforce that uh, I would hope that the governor's legal team has opportunity to take a look at the applicable federal statutes and federal rules and regulations and takes those into account because for a facility like ours, we would disregard the de Leon bill if it was passed uh, and would likely end up in court because it is unconstitutional. Thank you. Other comments here in Sacramento? And we have one question on the web that they are printing out for me. It's printed too small. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> when will the fiscal system be in place, and will all the information be moved there, or we still have the CRBS? And fiscal, I think I had somebody here from admin. Went fiscal in, in its entirety, or we, do you have the whole fiscal or just the CRBS piece? Okay, so go ahead, Terry. We're implementing fiscal uh, in 2015, and we, um, at that point, um, there will be a movement of data from one system to another. While it is optimal that we move clean data over into the new system, uh, it won't necessarily break the system if, if we, you know, as I said, we're doing a a site-by-site -site analysis on a priority basis of our sites. So we will be um, moving what we have left to evaluate over into the system, and we'll do that evaluation there in that system. So it will be our new billing system and our new operating system for this, and we will have to change our procedures to mesh with their system. So we it will be a stretch for us because some things are different, but um, there are they are doing some things for us. Um, for instance, give us the ability to bill several responsible parties as opposed to just one because we do have a unique process. So that's the process that we see. And we have meetings regularly with the fiscal team. So it's our admin team, our program team, along with fiscal. So they're sitting down with us. We're having these program and our needs meetings with them so that they're building the system to meet our needs. And as we identify issues, 
um, and capability issues that we need above and beyond the basic accounting functions that and budgeting functions that are coming and, and being built for the statewide functions of, of fiscal. They're, they are building it to, to customize for each of the departments. So as we come up against little blips, as some of the things that we've um, identified for um, the CRBS system, we've identified the issues. They have so far been able to um, address the concerns and issues that we've raised. So as we come up against them, they have addressed them so far. So to your, your concern in the email, um, will all of the information be moved? So far, I'm going to knock on wood. Um, so far, they have been able to address all of our concerns to date, and so um, let's let's hope it will continue that way. So, are there other questions here in Sacramento? And any other questions on the web? Great. I want to say that we've reached the end of our agenda, and I want to thank everybody for attending and listening in. Uh, we have had. And hopefully you have seen that we've made um, some significant progress here at DTSC. I want to thank all of the presenters and all of the staff that put in many hours in preparing uh, the work that led up to these presentations, as well as to the support staff that went in behind the scenes, as well as to our IT team that made this uh, go off very smoothly today. So thank you very much. And I didn't break anything, although it's early. Uh, we're not done yet, so I shouldn't have said that. Um, our next meeting is December 10th here in, at headquarters from 9 to 12, and it'll be in the Sierra Room. If you would like notifications um, via email, please add yourself to our email distribution list. The agenda will be, again, posted on the website. And again, I would like anybody here to um, sign up on a list at the back of the room and we can um, add you that way as well. I, again, thank you so much for taking the time to share part of your day with us and taking the time to be interested in the work that we do here at DTSC. It is incredibly important work to the people of California. We take our jobs extremely seriously and we have a duty and a responsibility to do it well and with great pride for the people of California. And I hope that you see that that's what we are doing and um, we want to continue to do that. So thank you very much and have a great rest of your day.